OCO. OCO. And welcome. Thank you all for sharing some time with us this evening. And I would like to uh, extend a special thank you to any veterans. Do we have any veterans here this evening? If you want to wave a hand or whatever. No veterans. Okay, very good. Yes, sir, right here. Um, so if you don't mind, I would really like for you all to stand and join me in uh, saying a pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and, and justice for all. And if you wouldn't mind also just uh, bow with me for a moment. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet here together and share and fellowship. We thank you, Father, for our veterans and our first responders and the great nation of America. Thank you for those that have come here tonight. Please be with them and take them home safely. Help us all to just have a good time together. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And, one, and it was right here in this building where I learned uh, my mother, my father had just passed away and my mother, uh, I was not living here in Bartlesville at that time, but I was here visiting. I came for the Indian Summer Festival and my mother brought me here because um, a friend of hers, Catherine Kelly, which is a Cherokee Nation National Treasure basket weaver, she always came here and sold her baskets. And so one day she just sat me down and she said, you're going to learn this. And so by golly, that's what we did. One day I, I did learn how to weave. And um, I just would like to recognize Catherine's daughter is here with us this evening, Renee Leonard. She's sitting right here at the front. Um, sadly, uh, Catherine passed away last month. So Renee probably needs a little prayer. If you can give her one so anyway um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the actual history of basket weaving and I'm, I'm gonna maybe do a little weaving as well but um, weaving goes back you know 300 years probably even further than that um, <clears throat> each region of the whole United States when you think about it, all those years ago, there were hundreds of Indian tribes. And I'm sure that they all did weaving of some form or another. But what they wove and what they wove with was uh, determined by the vegetation that was available to them. And um, I'm, I'm going to read you a little paragraph from a book here that has been a great source for me. This book is Weaving New Worlds by Sarah H. Hill, and it was bought for me by my mother on one of our many trips to Willow Rock, which was always great fun. For centuries, baskets have been part of Cherokee ceremony, work, and trade. They have been part of Cherokee life and legend. Made from materials gathered from local landscapes, they evoke the world in which their makers live and move and work. Over a period of more than 250 years, Cherokees developed four major basketry traditions, each based on a different material. River cane, white oak, honeysuckle, and maple. The incorporation of new materials has occurred in the context of lived experience, ecological processes, social conditions, economic circumstances and historical errors. Each basket is both an individual and a collective expression of those complex processes. So these baskets that I have here in front of me, some of them I have made, 
Um, this one, though, was made by my mentor, Katherine Kelly, and I wanted to, to share that with you all. When we uh, look back to the very beginning of basketry, river cane was the material that was primarily used. And the early explorers have documented or had documented about the vast growth of, of the river cane when they came. It was so dense and so tall you could not see through it. You couldn't even see light through it. And, and if you know about river cane, it's, it's very durable. And you think about how interwoven those roots were into the earth. So as a weaver, that, that means a lot to me because there's a lot you know, basketry, it has a timeline that goes along with what happened when the Europeans came, what was going on with the U.S. government. And I love just looking at those timelines. But the River Cane was certainly probably the most durable material. And the women were really the the weavers and the ones that used baskets. Baskets to those people then are what boxes, Tupperware containers, Ziploc baggies are to us now. That's all they had to store things in. And the women were the harvesters, they were the farmers in the beginning. So they had those big river cane baskets that they would strap on their backs and they would go out and gather corn or squash, whatever. So they were really utilitarian tools for them to use. And then as we go into, well, the river cane, um, I've, I've processed it one time in my life and it, it wasn't a, a real hard, process because I personally did not go out and gather it. I was invited to somebody's home that wanted me to experience the, the stripping and so um, she had a small swimming pool in her yard and she had these stalks of river cane soaking in water and you take those out and, and you have to pull that and you may use a knife to pull those strips but um, it's, it's a lot of hard work on your hands but it's certainly well worth it. So when we talk then about the, uh, the white oak, which of course is a tree, um, it too had a particular process that it had to go through. They would only um, harvest those trees that were probably only two to three years old because they were easier to cut down, they were easier to haul, they were easier to splint. And that period time began with the removal about that time of the Cherokees. The 19th century Cherokees fully incorporated the white oak into um, conventions of river cane basketry. So there again you see um, a weaving Everything that you look at about basketry, there is a weaving, whether we're talking about the roots of the plants that you use to produce it, or how it was, um, you know, guided by these um, obstacles, I guess, sort of Europeans and government and so forth. But the settlement patterns and the social systems were changing even the gender roles began to blur at this point because prior to this the men really weren't the farmers it was the women but at this point then the women began to join the women as a farmer as well as a weaver the white oak baskets were as much an index of change as the river cane baskets had been signifiers of continuity
And then we're going to talk about the honeysuckle. I have one honeysuckle basket right here that I have made. That period began around the turn of the 20th century. So there again, we think back to uh, when we talked about the vegetation that was available in different regions. Now, I'm not saying that honeysuckle was not available in North Carolina, but it may not have been as available. River cane was really what was most available until, of course, uh, the Europeans and all of that change came. But anyway, um, at that time, there were new federal policies aimed to assimilate the Native Americans through formal education, industrial training, and the eradication of native languages and customs. So there was sort of an Im imbalance at that point. Um, or maybe a determination to solve the Indian problem by destroying indigenous cultures, but was accompanied by a growing interest in Native American societies and artifacts which is interesting because it was actually the British arts and crafts movement that um, influenced a redirection of production of handwork in the economically depressed areas. In this strange combination of genocide and preservation, eroding land and a longing for traditional life ways Weavers began to make baskets of Japanese honeysuckle vine. So whether the, and I've read a few different things, you know, there was passage through the Bering Strait, maybe some came at those points, or uh, I think there was actually a botanist maybe up north, northeast, that had some brought in. But there again, you have that intertwining. The red honeysuckle, you cannot weave with, which is what is native here, because the vine itself has a hole all the way down through it. Just say like a bird's bone or a mouse's bone. So it's not sturdy and durable enough to weave with. It has to be the yellow and white, the Japanese honeysuckle. And that vegetation, along with the buck brush, which is more native here, is quite a process to gather and prepare. And there's a whole process of learning to dye the material, the different berries, leaves, barks, gulls, all those things can be used to make these beautiful colors that you see in these baskets. And finally, we come to the red maple, which is also a tree. So there again, it would have the same processes like the white oak, where they would cut them as they were young because they were easier to cut and move and strip but by this time it included the new deal for indians and this was a program that was Im implemented by the roosevelt administration as well as a indian commissioner by the name of john collier and it follows the development of cherokee dependence on tourism that has continued through the last de decade of the 20th century. In this era, federal policies encouraged those Indians living on economically depressed reservations to market themselves. And that's um, a lot of where basketry is today. But when you go to a museum or you go to an art market, and you see these baskets. This one, this is a buck brush basket. And 
My mother got it at Cherokee National Holiday, probably I was around 10, so 50. This basket right here is at least 50 years old. And if you pick it up and feel it, you can tell it still has a lot of strength to it. So as I grow and learn, I enjoy all, watching all of the involvement, the intertwining of the earth to the plant, to the weaver, and then to the purchaser. So I want to thank you all for coming and listening this evening. I appreciate your time. Gunga you. There's actually a little bit of math involved in weaving, but not a lot, which is good because I'm probably not a strong mathematician. So initially, I'm just going to, um, this, this style of weaving is uh, the Cherokee traditional double wall. So like this basket right here, where I'm at, I'm starting right here at the bottom. I would weave it all the way up, and then I'll turn it and go all the way back down.
that one basket with the kind of gray blue that's logwood which logwood is natural to brazil and i did i ordered that dye online and used it because i just thought it was a pretty color get the same color twice. Make sure you get all the, your, the project you're going to do in one batch. And when you dye um, the honeysuckle or the butt brush, it's such a harder material that you may let it soak for three or four days in that pot. And sometimes I'll, uh, I normally put it in a pot and I'll boil it and then I'll let it set. I may bring it back in a day and boil it some more and then just let it set. Just kind of depending on what it looks like and what kind of time I have. Do you use any kind of a mordant with these guys? You can. You don't have to, but you sure can. Because you'll get a lot of different shades and hues in there. Um, the buck brush and the honeysuckle, you have to put it in a big pot and it has to come to a rapid boil for at least five hours before you can strip it. If you'll grab that basket there on the end, that stuff that's on the top is the butt brush, and it has not been um, stripped, but if you'll see this lighter color, this is honeysuckle, and I did take the bark, outside bark off of that, but you can definitely feel the difference. Well, once you boil it for five hours, then you have to be immediately ready to sit down, pull it piece by piece, and you go to the end, and then you, with good cotton gloves on, <laughs> yeah. and you pull that bark off. So when you see those baskets that are $700 or whatever, now you kind of know <laughs> a lot of times people will ask me, how long does it take to make a basket? With this, yeah, I can probably tell you, <laughs> three or four hours I can make this. But for the other, for anything natural, you're doing all of this in a stage, and then you'll move and you'll go, you know, so it, it can take quite a bit of time. you know over and under right there because sometimes you're watching TV maybe or something and then you'll look back and you'll see oh man I messed up so then you back up and you're trying to have a pattern and even number of things coming down since you're going over and uh -huh. an odd number um, I start with an odd number yeah. yes but I learned if you start with an even number and you carry two of these at once and you're alternating, you do one that's plain and one that's colored. And so that way you can see the contrast in the basket when it's done. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> He's just tuning up his instrument. <laughs> it sounded like a C sharp, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. C sharp. 
Or I'll play it. Play it. So when I come to the end of this piece, I'm going to add another one. This is going to be the inside bottom of the basket. And since this is a double wall, and I, I'll come up and go back down, the places where you start and stop, they're, they're all hidden inside. You don't, you don't see any of that, you know. Maybe a little bit right there. You don't see as much you're looking for it. Yeah. yeah. National treasure for her basket. Yeah, and she used to come here annually to that Indian summer festival, and she would sell her baskets. But she she sat me down one day and she said, "You're gonna learn." So <laughs> yeah. that's what happened. <laughs> yes. Looks like that's a very good exercise for arthritis. Uh, you don't have any in your hands. <laughs> it can be. Well, yeah. um, yesterday I taught at the Westside Community Center, so I've been going out like to the Boys and Girls Club yeah. and different areas where I can teach children. Uh, it's always interesting because no matter how many start in the class, you're always going to have just a very few, but they have that skill set, and I mean they just they focus and, and they, they pick can it do up it. fast. Mm -hmm. They really do. Yeah. And their little hands are so yeah. <laughs> nimble. <laughs> Your granddaughter started to do this? Yes, my oldest granddaughter, in fact. Um, she probably didn't come tonight because she's kind of tired of it. Because she's with me all the time in the summer, so I drag her everywhere I go, and I go so much. So she's actually at home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How you get the side? <laughs> How do you? Here late. 
Um, it's Reed, R-E-E-D, Round Reed, Reed uh-huh. And you can actually also buy it in a flat where you can make more of a basket like what's there on the end. Mm -hmm. It comes in different gauges, like double lot up to, I think, maybe number six. This is a number two. Did it grow and around here? Um, no, this is a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> A turkey traditional double wall. Mm. So if you didn't want to spend all day doing that, make one basket. If you had a stick that would turn, <laughs> some way and you can put a pedal on it <laughs> and you could just breathe it in. True. True. <laughs>